Well, it is great to be back. I do love Texas, although I'm not sure what Tom meant by what he said about praying for me from California. I can tell you, though, it seems like half of my congregation has escaped from California and relocated to Texas. Um, I kind of thought about coming out here and just staying on this trip and seeing if we get the rest of our congregation to <laughs> come out to Texas. But then I got off the plane this afternoon and I saw this white frozen stuff on the ground. <laughs> Kind of thought I'd stick it out in California at least for another year. I don't know what that was, but I didn't like it. <laughs> well, it is good to be back at the Essentials Conference and what wisdom your pastor and your elders have here to sit down and map this out the way that they have. Uh, and as you did a couple years ago to dig into what does it mean for you to study the Bible on your own, uh, fantastic, essential, it's important. And I trust that if you weren't here, you go back and you get all that archived information, make sure you catch up. And then last year, evangelism, we talked about that and, and, and put it out there and discussed what that means and how to do it. And then this year, you saw it advertised that we would be talking about fellowship. And you might have thought, where's the wisdom of our leaders in that. I mean, who, I mean, who needs a whole weekend on fellowship? I mean, you could upgrade the coffee, teach everybody bunko. I don't know. You could, this, would, <laughs> this would be easy to do without a conference and taking notes and Bible study. I mean, why would... Fellowship. Well, it's not as easy as it sounds. As Tom has rightly said, and all your materials that have gone out, this is something much more uh, deep and comprehensive in the scripture than we often think when we hear the word fellowship. And so what I want to do tonight, just to kind of set the stage for the weekend, kind of uh, survey the landscape of what fellowship looked like in the early church, I want you to turn to a classic text in Acts chapter 2, right? Go to the very end of that chapter. We're going to look at verses 42 through 47 and just say, now, wait a minute. What does the Bible say fellowship is? Because it's a lot more than, you know, donuts and coffee and bunco. It's some, there's something more to this. And we need to look at all the tentacles of this, all the aspects of it. So let me tonight, hopefully, prayerfully, we will set kind of the structure, the skeleton of it, if you will. And then everything that comes after this, I'm, I'm confident, will begin to fill in pieces of this. And, and we'll look at various aspects of what it means to do the things we see here. But we want to read this text, first of all, verses 42 through 47. Just follow along as I read it for you, and then let's just look at it, untangle it a bit, and figure out if we can see the components of what the Bible means when we talk about fellowship. Verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and their possessions. And they were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now that last line takes us back to the first word in verse 42. That demonstrative pronoun there, that, that, that personal pronoun, they. What are we talking, who's the they? Look at verse 41. I mean, we started with just over 100 people there in chapter 1, and it says by the end of this preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost, verse 41, it says, and there were added about three thousand souls. I, I want to talk about fellowship and I'm going to get to that, but I just got a sidebar for a little bit and talk about that. 3,000 people. With the average church today being, uh, at least the average Bible teaching church, being under 100 people, it's important for me just to stop and to, to make a, a, a brief case for the large church. I mean, you're in a large church. You understand this is much larger than the average church. And I'm sure that Pastor Tom, along with all the other pastors of larger churches, get people all the time, you know, dissing on, complaining about the large church. They don't like it. Uh, listen, this is something that has been a regular phenomenon throughout church history. And we need, to, we need to defend it. The first church was a huge church, a large church. And we need to start with that just to recognize for a second that 
when you hear that grumbling, like I'm looking for a smaller church. You know, you have that kind of thing going on and you hear that and you've got to put a stop to that. You've got to put, as Spurgeon once said, the people that like to complain about church statistics are usually those that don't have any to report. And so I know that a, a, a lot of people are hearing from other people, well, you know, that church, their countryside, it's too big. I don't like it. You know, they're going to do building programs and multiple services and all of that. Listen, this has been a, a regular thing. To talk about Spurgeon, he had over 5,000 seats in his auditorium. Can you imagine how that would dwarf this auditorium? Right, think about that. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, three times the size of this auditorium, every week with people standing out in the lobbies and outside in the hallways. I mean, you go to Moody. Think about Moody Memorial Church back in the day when it was Chicago Avenue Church, 10,000 seats inside the building with thousands, they said, spilling outside of it. And I know a lot of people, they look at large churches as compromised churches. See, don't, don't believe that for a minute. You could look back at almost everyone in church history that you admire and the pulpits that they filled. See, th those, were, those were pulpits in big auditoriums, in big sanctuaries. And so we need to recognize when, when you've got a pastor like you have, and he is so gifted at opening the word of God. And I, I just, I want to tell you, you've got, he's not only gifted in, in expositing the word, he's wise in understanding the trends of the day and what's going on in the world and how the word of God needs to be properly brought to this generation. And you need to understand with a man like that who's preaching to you every week, the gift that God has given you, as Ephesians says, he gives gifts to men. You're going to have a church that grows. And, and we, as we sat at dinner tonight, he talked about, you know, it's tough. You got all these struggles with a growing congregation, but what are we supposed to say to them, right? Uh, don't, don't come here, right? Don't hear the word of God taught, right? Go just, I don't, stay at home. Of course not. We're all about seeing the church of Jesus Christ, as the bottom verse says, verse 47, seeing the Lord add to the number day by day, those who are being saved. If I said I could get, put 200 brand new Christians in this church next week, you wouldn't know where to put them. I understand that. But wouldn't it be a joy for us to see those names written in the Lamb's Book of Life and to have them under your pastor's leadership and his teaching, his feeding of the flock every week? That's what we want. We want to see that, right? Now, I understand it's people say, well, you're all about numbers. And they say that about big churches. Listen, if you want to say I'm all about numbers or your pastor's all about numbers, we're not all about numbers. I understand the disparaging nature of that comment. But every number represents a soul. You understand that, right? Every single number represents a soul. And when the text says in verse 41, there were added 3,000 souls. See, that's a good thing. That's a great thing. Heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. You understand that? It's a big deal. And we ought to rejoice and not, well, I used to find a parking space real close to the auditorium and now so crowded. I don't know anybody in the church. You know, all these young people, I, I don't go there. <laughs> don't go there. You need to embrace the growing church. And here's why. Because verses 42 through 47 say there's a whole lot more to it than you piling into a room and hearing the teaching of your pastor. It's called fellowship. And that's something that is very important. See, large churches are not injurious to Christian growth, right? They're, because they're only one component of it. When you assemble in a big room, in a big place, and you struggle for a parking space and all of that, that's just part of what we're doing. In the Christian life, there's so much more. And that's what this text really is describing to us. And what I want to do is just go through it and kind of glean what we're dealing with here. And the key word in the text, and we've ha we have it emblazoned on everything around this conference this week, and that's the word there in verse 42. It's the word fellowship. If you haven't blocked that off or bracketed it or highlighted it, it'd be good for you to highlight that. Fellowship. And I know this was a big word back in the 70s, but you know the Greek word, don't you? What is it? Hippies. Right? What, what is it? Koinonia, right? You know that Greek word, koinonia? Remember that it was all the rage at one time? Well, we're going to bring it back. Koinonia, right? Very important that we understand koinonia. What I want to do tonight is look at the aspects of koinonia, even visible right here in this text that we can see. And what you're going to find is that we see it used in two ways. We see it describing a passive kind of koinonia and an active kind of koinonia. Let's define it first of all. Koinonia, what does the word mean? Right? It means a commonality or a common participation, or even the word sharing might work. Okay? So these people, they're devoted to, it says in the middle of verse 42, to, to, to fellowship. What are you talking about? To commonality, to sharing. In what way? In an active sense and in a passive sense. Think this through now. 
They have a shared experience, and that does something to them as a group of people. And they're actively sharing among themselves. What kind of sharing? Well, let's look at it. Let's break this down. If you're taking notes, two big categories here. Let's start with passive koinonia. Passive koinonia or shared experience. Shared experience. Now, first thing on the list here in verse 42 is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching. And I hope you do, do as well. Right? Because that's what your pastors are doing in this church. They are expositing, they are reiterating, they're explaining, they're defining, they're sending out, every time we get together, they're sending out the apostles' teaching. The things that the Lord promised to teach through the apostolic band, and that's what's going on today as the pastor gets up, Lord willing, and opens the Bible. Right? And that's what happens here at this church. That's why it's growing, because the Bible is being taught and converted people, they're hungry for the Word of God, and so the apostles' teaching is going out. Now, when people get together as they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, it's a lot like this group here. It's that you all have chairs bolted to the floor facing this direction, right? Think about that. We're all side by side sharing the experience of the exposition of the Word, of the teaching of the things that God sent through the apostles. That's the shared experience of, let's call it this, letter A, if you're taking some notes, big church, if you will. You have a time, I don't know if your kids call it that, right? The youth group still call this big church? You're going to big church? Now I like the youth group, big church, big church. This is big church. The biggest common assembly of people together. My arthritis acting up. <laughs> We okay, Les? All right. I'll try not to, to do that anymore. <laughs> Speaking of junior hires. Um, <laughs> big church. We're talking about big church, are we not? Big church. Commonality. Drop down, if you would, to verse number 46. You can see this in the phrase there, day by day, continuing with one mind. There's the sense of commonality in the temple. Now, they weren't in the temple. They would have been, you know... <laughs> They would have been killed were they running into the temple. But that's the, the kind of uh, idiom, the way to talk about the Temple Mount. Several acres there on the top of the temple. If you've been to, the, to Israel, uh, where the Dome of the Rock Mosque is now, that big piece of property. They would assemble there, and they had a, a senior preacher, Peter, and, and all the other apostles, too, were teaching. But Peter was the primary quarterback of the early church, preaching and expositing the truth, right, directly, because he's an apostle. And that, by the way, in verse number 43, is why they did miracles and signs and wonders. Uh, and Tom's preached so well on this recently. If you want to talk about why they had those things to affirm the Word of God. Now, Tom is not doing, by the way, many wonders and signs here because he's preaching from the codified Word of God. See, New Testament preaching without a New Testament needed the verification of these things. Now we have the product of the apostles' teaching, and now it's taught. And as it's taught, we gather together, your chairs side by side, facing the front. You share the experience of the teaching of the Word of God. Now, let me say this about fellowship in the church, big church, letter A, if you will. It, it assumes that we are here physically together. Now, I know you stream this. Hello, Internet, right? You're streaming this right now. Now, here's the thing about that. That's not fellowship. That's not koinonia, right? That's kind of, I don't know, peering in, a kind of ecclesiastical voyeurism. I don't know. It's something. <laughs> they're, and, they're, and it's fine, right? We're providing the pipeline to the world so people can watch this. But real koinonia assumes this, that you're here physically participating, See, see, so you're tempted sometimes because your AV crew is so kind and gifted to bring forth all of this that goes on here so that you could conceivably on Sunday stay in your pajamas, could you not? And kind of peer in on what's happening there. And all I'm saying is unless you have a note from a doctor, don't. <laughs> right? Don't. We, do, we, we, we stream this here at Countryside for Tom's relatives, I'm assuming, and... <laughs> People, people that are sick, right? People that are shut in. If you're not shut in and you're not deathly ill, right, then we need you here. It's really crowded. That's all right. You are sharing the experience of the preaching of the Word of God. Hip to hip, because you guys got pews. In my church, you have, we have chairs, but you have pews the old-fashioned way. And you may have to sit hip to hip with people as the place is crowded. But hey, there's not 3,000 people here yet, right? It could be worse. 
and Lord willing, it will get a little worse, right? As we see more people say, but what's the point? You get here, you're a part of this. Which by the way is helpful when we think about koinonia, common experience. When you read the New Testament, we are reading the New Testament in, in letters, usually in the epistles sent to congregations, right? With, with a couple of exceptions. They're sent to congregations that share one primary preaching pastor, Right? And, and that preaching pastor and his team are shepherding and leading, but you've got a primary teacher there. And that then makes a lot of sense when we start reading, I don't know, 1 Corinthians 1.10, that we should be united, perfectly united in mind and thought. Right? You should all agree with one another, be perfectly united in mind and thought. Now, if you're just sampling the internet, right? you're just tuning into countryside because you're just scanning the, you know, the channels of the Christian churches and you like this guy and you like that guy and you like this church, you like that church, right? you'll never be able to obey that simple command because right? we all have different you know, nuances of beliefs about the secondary issues, even amongst good Bible-believing converted pastors. And so what you need to do is to be a part of one fellowship Right? You can, I don't know, peer in on other churches if you'd like. You can listen on the radio. I hear there's a couple good radio preachers out here in Dallas. <laughs> what time am I on out here? Does anybody know? Does anybody listen? What time? Nobody knows. Do you not know when I'm on? Am I on the radio? I am on the radio out here. 8.30 in the morning. If you're driving to work. 8.30 in the morning. And you can listen to those guys from California or wherever they're from preaching on the radio, but we're not your pastor, right? Your pastor's here. Your leadership team is here. You can't be perfectly united in mind and thought and have the common experience of sitting under the teaching of a pastor, right? If you're just, oh, there it is again. <laughs> if, if you're just sampling the teaching of others, I gotta move on for the sake of time. Maybe that's my reminder. Are you doing that on purpose back there? <laughs> Next point, next point, that's the button. Next point, move on. Okay, let's do that. Big church, shared experience. That's what's happening. They're devoted to the, com the, 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 the commonality of sitting through and experiencing the teaching together. Okay. Look at what, drop down, if you would, to verse number 45 in this text. Now, I don't want to stretch this too far, but you've got to admit there's something going on here. If not in this text, it's everywhere in the New Testament. But certainly we, we would think in verse 45, if they began selling their property and possessions and they were sharing them with all as anyone might have need, that's going to take some organization, right? That's going to take some what are the needs, what's going on. Oh, he needs a, I don't know, let's go back in time. He needs a donkey or he needs a, an oxen or his yoke broke. And, you know, oh, I got one. Well, let's get him, let's get that to that person. There's going to be some coordination. Now, again, there's not a lot here that we can draw from, but it does remind me that all throughout the New Testament, there is this picture of the shared experience, the commonality, letter B, of serving together, of serving together. There's something about not only just passively sitting through the preaching, now of course we're actively listening, but we together receive the teaching from the church, but then we get up, and that's the great thing about multiple services, by the way, and you go now with your team, your crew, to meet the needs in some area of the church. It may not even be on a Sunday morning, could be throughout the week, but you have a ministry team and you have the common experience side by side side by side of ministering to other people of sharing of meeting needs see that's your ministry team and everybody should be able to say that I have a church I sit next to other people in church we together receive the teaching and we have the common experience of big church and we also have the common experience of putting our hand to the plow and working together let me take you to the book of Philippians real quick. Keep your finger here in Acts 2 and go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, there's some great words here that Paul uses that bring up the reality of this. And if you get there and you're quick with your notes, you might want to also put the first chapter. Uh, I love verse number 27 that talks about they were all standing together uh, in one spirit, striving together. Uh, for, the, for the faith of the gospel. Love that picture. But here, see, even uh, more breadth of vocabulary in verse 3. Philippians 4, 3. This is after Iodia and Syntyche are arguing. And he's now telling Epaphroditus to help them get along. Remember that? Here he says in verse 3, Indeed, I love this. Now he's talking about Epaphroditus. We learned that from chapter 2, by the way. That, that he's the one carrying this and he's the one getting this instruction from Paul. He calls him a, underline this, true companion. 
put somewhere in the margin of your Bible or write it down if you would. This is the word in the old school translations might even just bring it straight across. Yoke fellow. Yoke fellow. You know what a yoke is, right? Not the egg kind, but the kind they put on oxen. This big beam across their neck with the loops that kept them pulling together. Paul, talking to his emissary here, Epaphroditus, he says, indeed, true yoke fellow. I ask you to help these women, right up there earlier in verse two, Yodia and Syntyche, who have, here's another word, shared my struggles. Now somewhere, write down this. This is the, there's a little compound word, soon in Greek, which is together. And aletheo, aletheo, aletheo. Does that sound like an English word we know? Athlete, right? Athlete. Soon athlete, if you will. Together athlete. We are striving together, working together, struggling together in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of mine. Now here's another word. Fellow workers. Soon ergos. Workers. To sweat. To work together. You saw your worship leader up here sweating. Did you not? If you sat in the front, you saw him sweating, right? <laughs> sweating together. And he wasn't here by himself. He had a team up here, right? Now they weren't sweating as much as he was, right? But they, that's his team. And trust me, there's something going on there called fellowship in that he together is ministering to you with his team. And you need to have that experience. I don't only sit there and receive the teaching of the word, but I have some brothers and sisters in Christ that I minister together with. Whether you're doing things, I mean, as, 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 as utilitarian as, as chapter two of Acts, where you've, you're meeting needs and organizing who the, who, you know, who's got what and needs what. I don't know. Maybe you got that kind of caring ministry here. Or maybe it's working in the E-Kids Club or in, in, in the kids ministry here at church. Whatever it is, you're locking arms with people side by side, going after a task of meeting needs. And you're sweating together. You're working together. You're soon aletheo. You're soon ergos. You are yoked together like Paul and Epaphroditus to fix a problem. Paul wanted Eodi and Syntyche to get along. And he said, now I know I got my, 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 my fellow soldier here who's ready to help me get this done. You need that. You need those levels. Shared experience, that's passive koinonia. You have that when you come physically and together experience and take in the teaching of the apostles through your pastor. Serving together, everyone needs a ministry post and you need some team members there and you're drawn together spiritually and socially and in every other way as you work together, as you labor together. Okay? Now, drop back down to Acts 2 now. Back to Acts 2. Let's look at a third component of passive koinonia. A third component. Now, we need to think, perhaps, of the things that are involved in this. But after saying, in verse 46, that they continued with one mind in the temple, there was some unity here as they got the teaching of Peter and the rest of them. It says, and they were breaking bread from house to house, and they were taking their meals together. We'll get to that in a second. But let's look at this last phrase, with gladness and sincerity of heart. Gladness and sincerity of heart. Okay? Sincerity of heart, we could say so much about that and what the word means, but even gladness, that's an easy one to, to, to envision in your mind. What's the context here? In people's homes, okay? Now, your home is your place you go to get recharged, to refresh, to get refreshed. It's your, it's your home, it's your house. Here they were getting in each other's homes and they were, they were having good, glad times together. They were experiencing some, some things and at the risk of stretching this paradigm. Let me call it this, the third component of passive koinonia. Let's call this the shared experience in refreshment, in common refreshment. Now again, this may not be the most dramatic example of it, but all you have to do is start thinking about Jesus and the disciples, right? They did everything together. And even in situations where you may think, oh man, I'm trying to be still. Is it my, is it the, my, I'll just, should, should we switch packs? Okay, let's switch packs. Okay, take a break. Intermission. <laughs> Testing. Are we back? Is it EQ'd to Tom's voice and now I'm gonna sound like Pastor Tom? <laughs> Make you all feel at home? So it sounds just like Tom now. 
because the guest speakers pack, they take that and tweak that just a little bit. So it's got the little dissonance in it. So you're like, ah, I'm glad Tom's our pastor. I don't know. They're, they're a giggly group tonight. It's a Friday, it's a Friday crowd. It's going to get more serious through the weekend, but I'm just, I don't know what I'm doing. All right. House to house gladness. Now, we were talking about the, the apostles. Think about that. And, and I just thought of Mark 6, for instance. In Mark 6, verses 30 through 32, take no time to turn there, but you might want to jot it down. Here's an example of a time when you may think that Jesus would want everyone to go away and do what he knows they need. What they need is refreshment. They were so busy, they couldn't even get a meal, right? They were so, you know, so busy in ministry. And instead of saying, you know what, guys, we're so busy in ministry, like we might say here, everybody just go home, let's just take some time off. Let's just take some time, go, go away and get refreshed. <laughs> get refreshed. Get refreshed. All right, I'm going to try. I'm just going to try. And, and we'll switch uh, Justin Bieber booms or whatever you call What are these called? <laughs> it's a guy you didn't want to think of tonight at church, I'm sure. I'm trying to talk about Mark 6 so badly. Right? Okay, that's right. Yeah. Instead of sending them all away, you know what he says? I love the way he says it too. He says, let's all come away by ourselves and let's go get some refreshment. I like that too. That's so good. And it's part of maybe why we lack a little bit in the soon Ergos and soon Aletheo department of not feeling like a team. If all this worship team does is get up here and serve and sweat together, right? what they also need to do is get some refreshment together. See, there's a part of our commonality, our passive koinonia, where we go do things in places that are places where we might normally just get refreshed on our own, but we do some of that together. We pull fellow brothers and sisters together with us. And if I said, when you're really tired and worn out, well, what would you do to get refreshed, right? Whatever those things are, well, I play golf, well, I play racquetball, I go shopping, I don't know what you do. All I'm saying is you need to look at your, your family of God your, your brothers and sisters in Christ say, I need to go get that refreshment together. Now, I know we all need time alone. Jesus did it often. He peeled away from the apostles, did he not? And he went away to a solitary place. We, we need those times. I get that. But he also realized there's times for his crew, his team, his apostles to go away and get refreshed together. And all I'm saying is it's easy for us. Even if we're faithful to be here as active participants in the church, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, and you're working at a ministry post, and you've got brothers and sisters in Christ, you text message and you email, and it's like, yeah, let's go get them this week, that every time you need to get recharged, you're always just by yourself. You're just alone, you ensconce yourself in privacy, and that's how you live your life. All I'm doing is trying to encourage you that the disciples and even the early church, I think by the nature of them going into their homes together and having these glad and sincere hearted moments, they were enjoying refreshment together. And some of you just need to do that. Things you would do alone or things you might even do with your, I don't know, your family members or your coworkers. We need to bring the body of Christ into that. I'm not saying you're bringing 100 people out you know, to your next whatever, your, your vacation, but I'm saying you are saying, I need to spend time with my brothers and sisters in Christ getting recharged. And I don't know what you do to, to recharge, but think that through. All right, now that's, those are the parts that are kind of hard and they're nuanced to pull out of this in terms of what we see in terms of passive koinonia. But the active koinonia, let's turn to that now. That's pretty clear to see. And that's something now that's gonna change some priorities in our lives, change our schedule a bit. Okay, let's stick there in that same verse we were looking at, verse 46. Day by day, they were continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Now, there's some interpretive options on that, what we're talking about. I think we're talking about meals, by the way. And I think that's why he goes on to extrapolate how those meals were coming off with gladness and sincerity. But there's, that's open for debate. But he says this, we know this, they were taking their meals together, taking their meals together. Now, there's something about meals that's unlike serving together and sitting in church together and even going to a ball game together or a football game or whatever. All of those things, the chairs are side by side. Hopefully, when you go and eat with someone, your chairs are face to face, 
right? You don't just line up, you don't go to Cheesecake Factory and all just sit on the side with the bench, right? <laughs> and just look out at the, you know, I don't know, whatever you can see from the bench side of things. You, don't you split the group up to where you're sitting with, with people on both sides? Yeah, you do. Les is having a very important conference. What shall we do? Can I get in on that? What do you want to do? Sh headset? Is it just me? It's Try that. <laughs> Active koinonia. Is that where we're at? Sharing meals together. The bench at, at Cheesecake Factory is what you're envisioning. <laughs> okay. What do you do? You break up and face each other. If you have people in your home, you do that too. You have a round table, you have an oblong table, but you face each other. See, when you, when you turn your chairs from side to side to face to face, we start a different kind of fellowship. Right? We go from passively working together, passively getting refreshed together, passively being taught together, to now our chairs go face to face. If your fellowship is only passive experience, there's a lot more to it. Now you have to share yourself. See, that's what happens at a meal. I went to, to dinner tonight with, with Jerry Rag and, and, and Tom Pennington, and we sat there, and we didn't just sit there silently eating our food like we would if we were eating our food by ourselves, right? We, we, had, we had to interact. I say had to. It was a joy to interact, right? It was a joy. I was looking forward to it. But we, we interacted. We talked back and forth. We learned things about each other. We engaged with each other. We talked about issues together. And that's the active sharing of myself, sharing of my thoughts. And when those meals were going on, you know, they were sharing. Let's just start with the meal thing, though. If you want to talk, this is an interesting study, and I did see one years ago, and, and, and maybe Jerry's got a lot more on this, knowing how he's uh, reading all this kind of that stuff, but if you just looked in the Bible for meals and food, right, and just looked at how that played into the work of what's going on in God's agenda amongst his people, it, it would, it's everywhere. If you just start looking for it, it's everywhere. Now, I'm not going to just survey the whole Bible, but just think about Jesus for a second. Obviously, he's having meals with his disciples all the time. Speaking of Mark 6, by the way, another thing went on there. He fed the 5,000. Do you remember that? And, and why? Send them all away, the disciples said, so that they then go buy food and have their meals. And Jesus said, no, let's have meals together. Let's have a meal together. Sit them down in groups and let's have a meal together. And even that, you know it's not a meal where we're sitting in rows looking at Christ eating right? You're sitting in groups and all those people are facing each other and they're sharing that experience there of eating, but they're also sharing themselves in the conversation of that meal. When Zacchaeus or, I mean, you could just look through all out the Bible. When, when there's an interaction to take place, it's interesting how often the meal becomes the setting for it, the canvas for it. Uh, the road to Emmaus. I think about that. How important was that after the resurrection of Christ in Luke 24? What do they do? Have a meal together. When Peter had stumbled post-resurrection, John 21, and Jesus wanted to restore him and get him back in the game, how did he do it? I love the way the Bible says he fixed him breakfast, right? A manly breakfast, broiled fish for breakfast. But he made him breakfast and said, let's eat. And you can imagine how that just, it's disarming. It's, there's something about that, sharing yourself over a meal. And let me get real practical. Are you doing that? How many meals do you take with the brothers and sisters in Christ? That's going to take some scheduling, some planning, some purposeful and intentional acts for you to say, I'm going to take more of my meals together because I need to share myself with the brothers and sisters in Christ at my church. So much we could say about that, but just start looking for it. You'll see it everywhere and start looking for the way that un unfolds. People sharing their hearts, their lives over meals. Now, we skimmed right past it in verse 46, but there's another phrase we should, we should bracket off. They didn't do it at the Cheesecake Factory. Do you see Cheesecake Factory in verse 46? No. What do you see? They did it in their homes, right? Now, there's nothing wrong with you going to restaurants. Together. That's great. I encourage that. But there's something about sharing your home 
Okay, the act of koinonia, sharing myself over a meal, but when it comes to you in my house, that's another level of being personal, is it not? That's another level of exposure, if you will. So let's put it this way, letter B, the, the sharing of my home. I share my meals, I share my home. Now the Bible talks about that. Matter of fact, you can't even be a leader in the church unless you are known for hospitality, right? Hospitality. And by the way, the leaders of your church are supposed to be the template of what you're shooting for in your life. You are, according to 1 Peter 5, supposed to be following their example, so the whole church should be known for hospitality. Now, hospitality, again, you may think of the Norman Rockwell picture or whatever. We should really think about the word. I don't have time for all this, but let me just quickly put, put this together. Xenos, you know that word? The xenophobia, xenos. In Greek, that means the outsider, the stranger. Right? The, the, the first part of that compound word is phileo. You know that word. What does that mean? Sunday school graduates. To love, right? To love. Brotherly love. Brotherly love of the stranger who's not my brother. Now think this through. That's the word phila, xenos, right? That translates into our language hospitality. Why? Because I am used to opening up my home to my family. Right? I'm not used to opening up my home, if you just think about how a home is used, to outsiders that aren't a part of my family. If the neighbor kid wanders into the garage and happens to find his way down the hallway and comes into my house at dinner time, I'm going to send him back to, to his house. This is not your house, kid. Go home, right? <laughs> Have dinner with your family because you're not my family. Now, here's what the Bible calls us, brothers, right? We are spiritually connected and one of the things that does is it allows me to take the outsider who really is not biologically an insider and bring them in I have an open kind of life as it relates to my home I share my home that needs to be a part of it and I'm telling you I get all the reasons you don't want to do this we're gonna talk about that tomorrow morning I, I, it's so, it's hard, it's difficult I mean, one of the, I, think about if I said we're all coming to your house after church tonight Oh, no, you'd be slipping out before the final song, right? <laughs> right? Think about that, though. There's that sense of the, all the, oh, I got to get everything together. All I'm telling you is the outsider in is the picture of me sharing my house more often. I need you. And I know so many people in the church that just don't ever want to let anybody in. And we'll talk about some reasons about why tomorrow. But I think we need to think about how actively do I share my home with the brothers and sisters in Christ that was certainly going on here in this text. More to say on that, but no time, no time. Thirdly, under the second part of this, take a look at verse 42. Verse 42. They continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, that's what we're talking about, to the breaking of bread, it may have been the Lord's Supper there, maybe it was meals, that's debatable. Let your pastor deal with that later. And then lastly, Verse 42, I'm not copping out, but I'm just saying, perfectly united in mind and thought, I'm not your pastor. Talk, ask him about that. I'm sure he's got an opinion on it. Uh, lastly, verse 42, and to, what's the last one there? Prayer, okay? Prayer. Now, if I just look at that and I just look throughout the rest of the book of Acts, how did these people share their prayers? You'd see how they did. It wasn't just some person standing up on the Temple Mount during a teaching service or a worship service and uh, everyone just listened to him pray and kind of agreed in their thoughts. Right? They were meeting together and they were praying. I think of that situation in Acts 12 when Peter was in prison, remember all that? And it says when he, he gets out, he gets led out by the angel and all that. And what happens? That he goes to a house where many had gathered and they were praying. This is not led by some person in a tie at the front of the room and a microphone. Right? These are the kinds of things where people get together, their chairs get face to face, and they pray to God. They share their voice, and they share their words to the Father. That is the third component, sharing our prayers. Right? I gotta share my meals, I need to share my home, I need to share my prayer. I don't like praying in front of people. I don't like, listen, we're gonna talk about this tomorrow get past all of those barriers. But for tonight, let me just say, that needs to be on the agenda. I need to pray together. It's intentional. I mean, it needs to be spontaneous. That'd be good. Out on the patio, I'm sure you see it here from time to time. People talking all of a sudden, man, we should pray about that. And you see these groups formed together and praying. And if not, we'll do more of that now after this sermon. Uh, 
but there's schedule times too. I can look at my schedule in my life and I pray with Christians. I pray obviously more alone by myself to God. That's just the pattern of most Christians. But there's several times where I have schedule and I'm praying with other Christians. I'm sharing my heart as I pour my heart out to God. I'm quoting their Psalm 62, eight. Think about the vulnerability of that. I'm talking about my relationship with God. I'm making my request before God. I am sharing myself to God and I'm doing that in groups. All of us need to be praying with other Christians. It's the pattern of the New Testament. It's what koinonia looks like. The active sharing of my home, my meals, my prayers. Here's another one to jot down. As if we had time to turn there, we don't. But James chapter 5, verse 16. Now think of the combination of these two things. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Protestants, what in the world does that mean? Right? Right? You're a Protestant, right? Right? You, you're not going to the mediation of a guy in a box behind a screen and confessing your sins to him as though that's going to do something in your relationship with God. This has nothing to do with my forgiveness before God. This has nothing to do with my repairing of my relationship with God. But this is something about the vulnerability of saying, man, here's something I've done that's been egregious to God. This has been a stumbling block in my sanctification. Pray for me. And we pray for each other. See, not only do I get to pour my heart out before God and people learn a lot about Mike Fabara's when we pray together, but you get to share with me the issues and I get to share with you my issues and we support one another. We get behind one another. We, we hold one another up. Some of the great things, I hear it all the time in, in our church where there's just all these spontaneous connections of people holding one another up in prayer. And those are often not scheduled because they're prompted by someone sharing a problem, sharing a, a stumbling, a, a, a vice, an issue in their lives. But that kind of mutual support, that kind of unifying effect, that kind of helping one another, bearing one another's burdens, to quote Galatians there, that's taking place when I share my prayers. And that's active. That's chairs face to face, right? Lastly, letter D Fourthly, in this, look at, there's several aspects to this, I suppose. When it says um, in verse 46, they continued with one mind in the temple. How in the world would we know if you're one mind? You've just heard the apostle teach. Peter's just preached on a topic about whatever. And how would you know if you're of one mind? Because you're sharing. You're sharing what? You're sharing what you understood from that sermon and what you're going to do about it. They were praising God, verse 47. That's assuming that I'm saying God has done something great here. God has provided. God has gotten me through something. They're sharing what the Lord did in their lives. So they're sharing what they learned from preaching. They're sharing what has happened in their lives. And verse 47, don't think this happened because God was spell spelling the gospel out in the clouds, right? They, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Why? Because chapter 1 said they had to be witnesses, now, I just want to add all those things together and, and summarize it this way, letter D. The act of koinonia here is they were sharing their knowledge of Christ. They were actively sharing what they knew about Christ, what they learned from the teaching of the apostles, what God had done in their lives and what they could praise God for, the gospel of saving faith and repentance. That, that, they were sharing that with non-Christians and people were being saved. Koinonia, active koinonia, isn't bunko and coffee. Right? Although it may involve that in the refreshment aspect of, of passive koinonia, I get that. And I'm all for bunko, although I have no idea what it means. I've never played it. But I know there's Christians in our church that I guess that's the Christian version of pokers, and I don't know. <laughs> is, is, it, is it cards? Is it cards? I don't even know. Dice. It's not, it's dice. Oh, it's worse. It's dice. <laughs> We are in California, right? I told you. I didn't know that. I hear the Christians in our church talking about, maybe the non-Christians in our church talking about Bunko. I don't know. Have you played Bunko? This lady has, because she knew it was about dice. Oh, you're from California. Well, you don't count. Has anybody in this church played Bunko? Have you? Oh, you sinners. Okay. We shouldn't be talking about Bunko right now. <laughs> what I'm telling you is, though that may fit under the passive koinonia, right? Section one, letter C, right? Coffee and Bunko is not what we're dealing with under letter D here in the second part. I'm actively talking about what I learned from God's word, what I learned from the teaching, what, I, what God has done in my life and I'm praising God for and I'm telling you about that. 
what the gospel is. I even think about when Priscilla and Aquila took Apollos aside, right? And Apollos was teaching and they explained the way of the Lord more accurately to him. It's that sharing of the knowledge of God, okay? And you may say, well, I just don't know much about the Lord. Everybody in this church more mature than me. Listen, you don't have to know more than the next guy about the Lord to go from this conference and sit down with someone, chairs face to face and say, this is what I took out of the, the Essentials Conference this year. This is what I learned. This is what I'm going to put into practice in my life. Sharing that, the iron sharpening iron, the stimulating one another to love and good deeds, all of that going on because I'm talking about the Lord. I'm talking about what he's done for me. I'm talking talking about what I've learned from his word. I'm talking about what people need to do in response to it, particularly the lost people who need to learn what it means to be reconciled to God. Now, just laying that out like I did, chairs side by side, passive koinonia, big church serving refreshment, active koinonia, chairs face to face, meals, home, prayer, knowledge of Christ. You're going to go, I don't have enough time for this, right? I don't know if the people are doing this. I don't know how they, where they get the time. They get the time the same place you get the time. Right? You, we all have the same amount of time. Have you noticed that? I have no more time than you have. We have 168 hours a week. That's how many hours you have. And I understand this. A third of it is going to go to ablutions and illustrations and teeth brushing and sleeping and eating your meals and all of that. But you've got another third. You're saying, well, I can't do it. I got a job. Right? You're a pastor. You work one day a week and I, the, I got to go to work. Right? <laughs> Fine. You work. Do you know that if you worked really, really hard and commuted a long way, that's still only another third of that? You've got probably 60 plus hours that you choose to expend when you're not sleeping, you're not you know, putting on deodorant, you're not brushing your teeth, you're not earning a paycheck and you're not commuting to work. Well, I got kids, fantastic. All I'm telling you is this, you got 60 hours, and you know how most Americans spend that 60 hours of, of, dispend, of, of expendable time, right? Today, for the first time in the surveys that have come out, they're spending more time, you know, snooping on people on Facebook and web surfing and all the rest, even more than TV. What are the stats? 30 plus hours on, on the internet. Think about that. Texting and Facebooking and web surfing and just shy of that for watching television, sitting on your recliner with the Cheez-Its in your lap, watching TV, okay? Now, all I'm saying, that, that's a lot of hours. By the way, less than three hours reading. That used to be popular. Um, I'm not here to talk about reading. That's a de Essentials Conference number four will be about reading. No, you've already got it mapped out. See, that didn't get a big laugh because that's convicting. We don't read enough. <laughs> What's the point here? You and I have the same amount of time. What we need to do is shift some of that third of our lives that you have to invest in other things. And here's the good news. A lot of what you want to do anyway, you could do. Well, I like watching the ball game. Great. What did I say? At least one aspect of this is being refreshed together with brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, and doing things with your kids. Great. You can serve together as a, as a mom with your kids and another Christian mom and her kids in your church. All I'm telling you is there's lots you can do to take that 60 hours or so and to put that to work in seeing our lives connect more in active koinonia and passive koinonia. So much more to say about it. That's why there's not just one sermon to the Essentials Conference. It's going to go on all weekend, all right? But that just lays the groundwork. Let's pray together. God, help us as we think about this topic so important. And if we just look in at the, the landscape and survey the landscape here, I know it brings some conviction to all of us. And even to myself, just preaching this, I think about just that that bent to want to just kind of isolate. It's easy to do. I know it's hard for us to really think about sharing our lives and sharing our knowledge of God all the time and sharing our prayers and our meals and our homes and all that, that kind of thing. Is, it's, it's, it's costly, but God, it's the kind of cost that as we look back at it, we recognize what a good expenditure of our lives. And we'll look at it tomorrow, God. Some of our excuses, some are lame excuses, and some, they're, they're serious. They're just weighing the cost of all of this. But help us as we think through this weekend of what we really are obligated to do with one another and to one another in the body of Christ and take it seriously. Let us respond to your word as it's living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword and piercing down into our conscience tonight and giving us that sense of, yeah, that's right, I, I, I need to see that happen in my life. And God, I know when we respond to your word, it is so good. So good for us. We recognize it glorifies you. It brings glory to you. It's the kind of activities, the kinds of activities that really you've designed us. You've designed us 
to be not just social beings, but you've redesigned us as Christians to really profoundly connect with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So make that more of our lives, I pray, as a result of this weekend, in Jesus' name, amen.